Good morning. morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. Those of you here in the sanctuary, those of you watching at home on Comcast, and those who may be watching later on on YouTube, we trust that today's worship service will be a blessing to each and every one of us today. Next Sunday, we are having, uh, our district is having a leadership event. It will be held next Sunday afternoon at uh, Crossroads United Methodist Church in Washington, Illinois. I am planning on leaving from the parking lot here at 12.30 p.m. If anyone wants to go with me, just meet me there, and uh, we'll go and have a good time. Uh, Super Bowl is coming up, I think, February the 4th, the first Sunday in February. And uh, if you'd like, you can purchase sub sandwiches on that day from the youth group. You have an order form included in your bulletin. So uh, please complete that, get that turned in to the church office or to Lisa. And offering envelopes for 2018. We still have some box sets of offering envelopes. If you have not yet received yours or picked yours up, they are now located uh, down the hall back here by the office area. And if you do not find a box set of offering envelopes with your name on them, please contact either Randy, the church secretary, or myself, and we'll make sure that we get some to you. Uh, Lisa has an announcement, and Tom Pitzer has an announcement to share. Good morning. Um, we'd like to say thank you to everyone that came out and supported the youth group at our chili supper last night and the ones that participated putting their chilies in for the chili cook-off. Um, we have containers, small and large containers, for sale of chili today in Fellowship Hall. The cost is $3 for small and $6 for large. If you don't want to cook, it'd be a good time to buy some chili. So thank you very much. I'm just up here in, uh, uh, for the uh, Potter's Club. Uh, we want to get our Potter's Club uh, to gr- grow and increase. Uh, we invite you to join us the second and fourth Thursday night of every month at 6 o'clock downstairs in the Jonas room. You come in on the side uh, door here and down the steps and to your left. Uh, we have Bible study and uh, just fellowship and have a good time every Thursday night. Uh, and also, if you like biscuits and gravy, scrambled eggs, uh, Sweet rolls and coffee. We have breakfast the last Saturday of every month. Uh, we get here about 6, 6.30, and the coffee's on. We have fellowship and laugh and joke and tease each other. And, and then about 7 o'clock, we break the eggs, uh, get the biscuits going. And then at 8 o'clock, we eat, and we have uh, a good time, a fellowship. And then we get up and clean up about quarter to 9. By 9 o'clock, you're out of there. We're, you're on your way home, so it doesn't take long. And we have a good time. We invite all of, all the of men and bring your, you bring your sons, grandsons, your grandpas, and everybody, and join us for breakfast uh, the last Saturday of every month. And that's this coming Saturday. Thank you. So the Potter's Group is open to men of every age uh, from the congregation as well as from the community. So uh, be prepared to become a part of that this Saturday, 8 a.m., breakfast will be served. As the choir sings the introit, let us turn our hearts and our spirits unto God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, 
Help us to stay focused on you this morning. Help us to come together to worship you and to praise your holy name and the sure knowledge that as we lift up your name in adoration and praise, our spirits, our souls, the very depths of our being will also be renewed. But don't let us get confused, God. Don't let us think that this is about us. Always help us to keep in mind that this time is only about you and the love that you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you please turn in your hymnal to page 110? 110, would you please stand as you are able and join us in singing. Our act of praise today is found on page 83, as we read in unison the canticle of God's glory, page 83. Let us join together in reading, glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth, Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. 
We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Please take a few moments to greet those around you this morning. Please turn your hymnal once again to 394. We're going to sing 394 through twice, and then we're going to go across the page and do Spirit of the Living God twice as well. Spirit of the 
living God fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God on me. and almighty God you are our rock you are our refuge you are our strength you are our help in every time of need and we give you thanks and praise your holy name once again God earlier in the week there were several people who told me that they no longer watch the news or pay attention to the news because it's only bad and I understand that. There's a lot of bad things that go on in our world. There are tragedies that occur. Some of them are, are what we would refer to as natural disasters. There are people who do bad things and hurt other people. And sometimes, God, we get overwhelmed by all of the bad that we see in the news. In those times, God, help us to remember the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us to be the kind of people who, although we too are frustrated with the affairs of our world, the affairs of our nation, that we have been called to be light and salt and leaven. We're called to be like Jesus who went about doing good and touching other people with your love and with your mercy. So may we be people who go about doing good, touching others with your love and with your mercy. Help us, God, to be the instruments that can change good, bad news into good news, and help us to look for the good in other people recognizing that we all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Again, God, we pray for our service people serving around our world, some in very dangerous places. We ask that you would end conflict. We ask that you would end war. We ask that you would end civil strife so that soldiers and sailors and whatever branch of the military they may be in would be able to return home safely and return home soon. We pray, God, for your church in every place and everywhere. Help her to be faithful to the task of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of our world. Help the church to remain faithful, God, even when it seems as though the church is in decline. Help us to keep our eyes not on our goals, not on numbers, but help us to keep our eyes focused only on you and what you call us to do. 
There are so many other things, God, that we could be praying for this morning, and we simply lift those up before you in our heart and in our soul, asking that you would bring healing and health and wellness to individuals, to communities, to nations, to our world. All of these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, I do a lot of different jobs around the church, and one of them that I really enjoy is the acolyting. Um, this year we're going to have six new third graders trained to do acolyting. Um, it's an easy job for the kids, but it's also a hard job, and I want to thank the parents to have them here every Sunday to do the acolyting job that they're signed up for. Today I'm going to um, present acolyte pens to two of them. One of them is Jared Gould. And the other is Megan Oliver. She hasn't been doing it long, but she's my fill-in girl. Her and Nathan are always my fill-in kids um, when someone's not here. So today I want to present them with an acolyte pen and thank them for their, their job and how well they do. All right, good job, guys. Thank you. And again, thank you to the parents and the kids for doing this every Sunday. Am I right, Lisa? You get an acolyte pen after you've done it for 10 times, right? So they've done it at least 10 times, probably more. We just kind of lose track sometimes. But thank you, Jared and Megan and the other acolytes for your service in our congregation. Today in our celebration of service, we recognize our board of trustees. According to the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church, a local church's board of trustees, subject to the direction of the charge conference, shall have the supervision, oversight, and care of all real property owned by the local church. The Board of Trustees is entrusted with annually reviewing the adequacy of our insurance. The trustee shall also receive and administer all bequests and trust funds made to the local church, and the trustees are to ensure that an annual accessibility audit of our buildings is conducted. Now, most of you are aware that our current church building was built in 1926 and in 1927 and there's a lot to take care of and the board of trustees meet regularly to talk about what needs to be taken care of and to do their best to address any needs or concerns that we have if you are currently a member of the board of trustees would you please stand so that we can recognize you current members of the board of trustees thank you If you have ever been a member of the Board of Trustees, would you please stand? If you have ever been on the Board of Trustees. Well, thank you for your service over the years. And we thank you for everything you do on behalf of our congregation and behalf of the kingdom of God. As we prepare to serve God with the presenting presentation of our offerings, Hear these words from 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all people. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Once again, God, we ask that you would bless the giver and these gifts, that the purposes of your kingdom might be uh, carried out in and through our lives and in and throughout our world. To your glory and to your honor, we ask it. Amen. Please be seated.
This time I invite Harriet and Jim to come forward in congregation. Would you please turn in your hymnal to page 33? Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. Today, Harriet Huber presents herself as a candidate to join our church on profession of faith, and Jim Brannick presents himself to transfer his membership from First Baptist Church here in Kiwani. Uh, Harriet, I ask you these questions. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, uh, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church? and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. I will. And these questions are for both of you. As soon as I get, as soon as I find them, they'll be for both of you. Well, I've gone too far, I think. Here we go. Both of you will reply to these. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. And as a member of the, members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I will. Harry, would you please kneel in front of me? Harry Huber, remember your baptism and be thankful. The Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may stand up. Will both of you turn and face the congregation. Congregation, we are on page 38. Down at the commendation and welcome. Congregation, would you please rise. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Congregation, you may be seated. Congratulations and welcome to you. I'll do her first. Congratulations and welcome. And these are your certificates of membership, one for each of you. Thank you. And you may return to your seats. Thank, Thank you. you. You're sure welcome. Our first scripture this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter, verses 1 through 6, found on page 726 in your pew Bible. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. 
In the shadow of his hand he hid me, and he made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in which I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Our next scripture is from 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 16 through 21, found on page 1145 in your pew Bible. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. As the children go to Children's Church, would you please sing along 349? We'll sing through it twice. upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your fourth chapter of Mark, Jesus tells a parable, and uh, he says, a farmer went out to sow some seed. Now, William Barclay, in his commentary back from the 1960s, uh, says that in the New Testament time, there are two ways of uh, planting or, or scattering your seed. One of them is what we generally refer to as broadcasting. You simply carry your seed in a pouch and you stick your hand in there and you just let it go out like that. Wherever, wherever it lands is where it lands. But he also said that it was common also for them to put a bag of seed on the back of a donkey, tear open a corner of that bag of seed, and as the donkey walked along the field, the seed fell out on the different kinds of ground. Barclay also says that the fields in uh, Galilee at that time were narrow strips of land basically between walking paths for the public, what we would call, uh, they weren't really streets, but in some cases they would have been wide enough to get a cart down as well as some people down them. And oftentimes as the um, farmer would scatter his seed, whether it's by broadcast or by the um, uh, donkey way of doing it, 
that seed, some of it would fall on the, the walking path. That, of course, was trod down, packed down, and that seed would simply just lay there. It wouldn't have a chance to sprout. Perhaps the birds would come along and eat it for themselves. And uh, Jesus would later say that there are some people who are like that, that when they hear the Word of God, they're like that packed down path. And the Word, that Word that has been sown, doesn't sprout within them at all. And then Jesus said there was some other seed that fell among the rocky soil. Now, sometimes when we think about rocky soil, we think of soil that has rocks scattered throughout it. But again, Barclay says that in the Galilee, New Testament Galilee, it was more like there would be a shallow, uh, some dirt on the very shallow dirt, and underneath there would be like a ledge of rock, like what we would call shale, perhaps. And when the seed fell on that shallow ground, it may begin to sprout. It may start the process of sending down roots through that shallow ground. But when it hit that rock shelf, it had no place else to go. And the roots were not deep enough yet to neither support the plant nor to get nutrition out of the earth. And it would quickly wither and die. Some people, he said, are like that. They may initially receive the word, but they do nothing in order to set their roots of faith down deep, and so they wither and just kind of disappear. And then Jesus said there's some other kinds of ground, ground that looked good, but it was filled with thistles and weed seeds. And when the seed fell on that ground, it began to sprout and it began to take root and it looked like it was going to be a healthy plant but then all of a sudden the weeds start to take over and eventually choke out the good plant and it yields nothing if you've ever had a garden perhaps you've known that experience of the weeds just kind of taking over especially if you're on a two-week vacation and came back And Jesus says some people are like that particular kind of soil. They may hear the word, they may allow for it to take root, and then after a course of time they kind of allow the affairs of the world and other busyness to kind of get in the way, and they eventually allow their faith to be choked out. And then Jesus says there's another kind of soil. This was good, clean soil, what we would call fertile Perhaps the kind of soil that farmers find around this neck of the woods. The ground in this neck of the woods, I can tell you, is a little bit better than the ground in some other neck of the woods in the state of Illinois as well as other places around our world and our country. But Jesus said that seed fell on the good ground and it took root and it went down deep and it brought up all these nutrients and it flourished as a plant and then it put forth the kind of seed that it's supposed to, and if it's a, a corn, it would produce ears of corn, and if it was wheat, it would produce heads of, of wheat, and, well, you get the point. And he said it might produce 30 times, it might produce 60 times, it might produce 100 times over again. And he said there are some people who are like that. The seed is planted in their lives. They allow for it to take root. They allow for that root to go deep down into their lives. And they prosper. And they give forth fruit. And they produce fruits 30, 60, 100 times in their lives. Of course, one of the questions that this text brings up is, what kind of soil are you? That should be the title of the sermon. What kind of soil, not seed, are you? Are you the kind of seed that just, are you the kind of soil that's been tramped down and pushed down all your life? Or are you the kind of soil where there may be a little bit of growth, but the rocky ledge has kind of prevented that from growing very deep? Or are you that weedy and thorny soil that you kind of allow other things to take precedent in your life rather than allowing the kingdom of God to, to become your primary focus? Or are you fertile ground? 
allowing the Word of God to go deep into your life so that you can produce fruit for the kingdom of God. What kind of soil are we? Now, as we think about that for ourselves, I also want to suggest to you that this parable is an encouragement to us who are sowers. Because Jesus says, as we sow the seed of the kingdom of God, there's going to be some people who are resistant to the gospel. They're like that packed down path. And they're not going to receive the word that you have for them. And there's some people who they may receive the word initially gladly, but then they will fall away because they have no root among themselves. And then there's some other people who are kind of got those thorny lives going, and they may receive the gospel, and they may first allow it to go deep into their lives, but then some weeds take over in their lives, and the thorns take over in their lives, and they end up being choked out of their faith. And there are people who will hear the word gladly and they will respond and they will produce fruit, even so. And I want to suggest to you that even as we look at our own lives about the kind of soil that we have and about ways in which we can allow that soil to kind of turn into from the hard pathway to the fertile ground that produces 30, 60, and 100 fold, that we also be persistent sowers of the word, knowing that there'll be some people who aren't going to receive the word, at least initially, and there are some people who are going to receive it with gladness and rejoice, and we'll see the fruit of their faith. We don't know how people are going to respond to the sowing of the seed. But the parable teaches us that we are to sow the seed and leave the results to God. Now, I was thinking about this parable yesterday as I was driving either up to Dixon or back from Dixon. I don't remember now which direction we were going at the time. It was up to Dixon, Diane was driving, and I was just had time to think in the passenger seat. But I was thinking about that, this parable. And I began to think, you know, this parable really doesn't make a lot of sense in some ways. Got any farmers in the house? Raise your hand. Some of the, farmer, some of the farmers are uh, snowbirds, so they may not be here. So how many, of your far, how, how many of your farmers, when you get ready to plant your corn... Take your tractor and your planter and you go down the lane that leads from the shed to the field and you let down the planter and you try to plant seed in that lane. How many of you do that? That wouldn't make sense, would it? That lane's been driven over and it's packed down and it hasn't been plowed and it hasn't been prepared but you're going to waste good corn seed, planting it all along the pathway there? That doesn't make sense. How many of you, if you know, now we, kinda, we do have an advantage over the first century farmers. First century farmers didn't have Roundup and all of the other kinds of stuff that farmers have now to put on their fields to make them a little bit more productive. And they didn't have, they probably didn't have seed counts on how many seeds are going to be planted in a particular acre and all that kind of stuff. And they certainly didn't have GPS and all, all that. So we have some advantage, but most modern day farmers are not going to take their tractor and their uh, planter, even if it's GPS directed. They're not going to take that instrument and they're not going to go and try to plant seed corn on their waterways or someplace where they know that it's kind of foolish to try to plant corn there because it's not going to grow. If, or if it grows, it's not going to produce very much. Most farmers I know try to find the fertile ground. They try to make that ground as fertile as they can. Now, it helps if you have good ground to begin with. My mom owns 60 acres of farmland in east central Illinois. 
it produces about 100 bushels of corn an acre. That's a half of 200, less than half of 250 bushels of corn per acre that some farmers get around in this area. So you're dealing with different types of soil, but you're still going to try to do your very best to make your ground as fertile as you can. So I'm thinking, well, that farmer, first century farmer, he didn't seem very smart. Allowing seed to land on the pathway, that, that's a waste of seed. Putting seed on shallow ground where you know it's not going to take deep root and grow, why bother putting seed there? Now, I can understand putting seed in the ground that looks like it's fertile, looks like it's healthy, looks like it's going to produce, and yet you fail to see the weed seeds that are down in that ground. Farmers today, at least, try to find the most fertile ground they can and do what they can to make that as fertile as they can and maintain the fertility of that ground. And it really didn't make a lot of sense to me that that farmer in the first century would waste his seed on these other soils. But you see, the point of the parable is not really about that farmer. It's really about where we sow the seed and our willingness to be reckless with the seed. We don't know if somebody's heart is going to be hostile or resistant to the gospel. We don't know if somebody's heart is neutral to the gospel. We don't know if somebody's heart is interested in hearing the gospel or if they're receptive to hearing the gospel. Jesus simply says, scatter the seed. Let it fall where it will. Some people will say no. Some people will say maybe. Some people will say yes and fully involve themselves in the Christian faith and growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ passage from Isaiah said you are my servant Israel and it's not enough that you just kind of enjoy the blessings that you're able to enjoy from me but I also expect you to be light light not just to yourselves but light to the nations and the apostle Paul writing in 2 Corinthians said you are called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ to go out into the world, to do good, to sow the seed, and heed the words of Jesus. Pray that the Lord may send harvesters out into the field, for the fields are ripe unto the harvest. Let us pray. Again, God, so often we become discouraged because it seems as nobody responds to your word. And we're out there all alone. Help us to heed the message of Jesus that we're called to be sowers of the seed and to leave the results to you. So God, use us again as the instruments and as the vessels of your love, your grace, and your goodness. Again, help us to be light. Help us to be leaven. Help us to be salt. Help us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For in our world, there are people who are hurting. There are people who are filled with a deep sense of helplessness and hopelessness. There are a lot of people in our world who feel like God has given up on them. Help us to be the kind of people, God, who can tell them that God hasn't given up on them. That God sent His only Son to die for them. And may so you use us as your your servants to bring light to the nations. And may the purposes of your kingdom be eternal and everlasting. Amen.
Our hymn of consecration and sending is found on page 568. Would you please stand as you are able, 568. the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 